the Deus Ex Machina. This is, um, you know, the, perhaps the uh, the most obvious um, uh, stylistic uh, device that that there would certainly be very unusual to a modern audience. The big crane uh, having a god or character swung on stage to hover above or above the stage to hover above the other characters. Usually, it was used at the end of the play to wrap uh, wrap the play up, where you'd have a god explain subject, explain the ending of the play to the characters and off he or she would go. So a little bit unusual here in that we've had a character who's been walking around on the stage all the way through, uh, all the, way through the performance, who's now in, in the deus ex machina and getting hoiked off, um, as, well, to Athens. She's escaping in her chariot drawn by dragons. Um, and I think that's also significant because it seems to me that the cosmos, the gods, effectively support Medea. They don't condemn her. She seems to sort of almost get a thumbs up from, uh, from, from, from the sort of divine aspect of the world. Um, there's no punishment for her. Jason, is, if anything, is the only person who gets punished, not obviously those who, you know, Creon and Glavke and so on, who, who, uh, you know, who are variously tor uh, torched and poisoned and so on. So that raises interesting questions within the play. The, the obviously evil character gets away with it, and seems to be rewarded by the cosmos. Euripides was known for using the uh, deus ex machina a lot, and uh, even teased by contemporaries like the comic playwright uh, Aristophanes, who in fact regularly put Euripides in uh, comedies as a character. Um, I think even the aspect of comedy is worth mentioning because at the Festival of Dionysus you would have these tragic plays which uh, uh, were meant to promote catharsis and so on and uh, contained lots of praise of Dionysus. But then you also had the comedies which were, you know, extremely vulgar, very funny, lots of people with big leather phalluses wandering around, pissing themselves. Uh, sometimes Dionysus himself was a character in the comedies and he's shown as being ridiculous and cowardly and so on. So if, we're, if we think back to the idea of the agon, this somehow divided uh, aspect of the Greek mind that was, that was both divided and coherent at the same time, that they could see that the truth emerged perhaps out of a collision of opposites, drama, uh, sorry, tragedy and comedy, and uh, in fact, on any subject, two opponents arguing about that, encountering each other and arguing. Medea also contains a critique of what we might call conventional masculinity, although even then it's problematic. Medea has statements that sound almost feminist in a 20th or 21st century um, line. The one's about, I'd rather stand three times in the front line of battle and bear another child, and, uh, and so on. Um, and remember that almost all the audience, as far as we know, would have been male. All the actors were male. The playwright was male. So, um, so, so we can imagine these would have been possibly sort of controversial and strange, uh, uh, strange statements to hear in what to us we would call an oppressive and misogynistic society in ancient Athens, where... Um, wives were generally, you know, meant to go about uh, with headscarves, veils. Uh, they were meant to, if they went out at all, they were meant to stay in the house and uh, and be domestic. So, uh, so, so Medea's uh, Medea's assertion of her sort of powerful femininity, of her her sense as well that that women have been traduced throughout history because male poets are the ones who've written all the stories. This strikes us as very modern, but I think we should be careful here. Because, of course, these statements have put in the, mouths, in the, in the mouth uh, of a child murderer, of someone who's arguably a monster, and uh, also a barbarian, someone from the East, someone from what is now sort of Turkey. So, uh, I mean, it's possible that certain members of the ancient Greek audience would have said, well, of course, you know, she's a woman, she's a barbarian, of course she'll say these crazy things. And the fact that she goes on to murder her children just goes to show you what sort of person feminists are. So be careful in your essays of taking what I might call a simplistic feminist line on, um, on Medea. It's not that straightforward. And again, Euripides' contemporaries, including Aristophanes, um, 
criticised him for his negative portrayal of women. Okay, so Euripides had almost a reputation as something of a misogynist, even in arguably a misogynist society itself. Now, the issue about uh, chauvinism, by which I mean a sort of excessive love of one's country, or not an, an excessive, but a sense that you, we're the best and we don't need to, uh, to account for ourselves, and it's self-obvious that Hellenistic civilization is superior to others. I mean, this, you could say, was at its height. I mean, the Euripides was writing at the time of, um, um, actually slightly after the Peloponnesian Wars, um, and uh, Athens particularly had a had a very high opinion of itself. Um, and we know that uh, Euripides and Socrates, who, who by all accounts were friends or, or contemporaries, were very concerned about the standard of political debate and, uh, yes, within Athens, that Athens had become sort of uh, stuffy and uh, self-satisfied, and that this was uh, needed shaking up, but it was also dangerous that it could lead to the... the um, mistaken political opinions, which could end up leading to disaster for Athens. And, uh, and so Euripides was a, I think we could say, he was a, he was a provoker. Uh, his plays were intended to stir people up. Um, if you remember, you know, he was something of an enfant terrible. Remember that article I showed you, The Bad Boy of Ancient Athens. This was somebody who wanted to get a reaction, again, a bit like Socrates. Socrates supposedly, you know, walk, would walk around the marketplace, put questions to people, annoy them. Why do you think you do what you do? Is it just because that's habit? Do you actually have a good reason for it? No, you can't account for your opinions. That's what Socrates would, uh, uh, you know, how he begun, he, how he began his uh, process of philosophical investigation. And in fact, he was nicknamed, or I think he took even the name himself, the gadfly, you know, a, an annoying insect that stings people and removes them from a... Um, uh, from a uh, for, from a position of um, you know, from from comfort, and I think Euripides' plays do the same. They discomfort us. Okay, they don't necessarily have a conclusion. They don't have a, have a clear message. They aim simply to make us feel less comfortable in what we think we know. I think the deer does that very well. So 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 the very if you I mentioned earlier the strangeness of Medea may itself be the point of the play. Uh, and by Vatic, V-A-T-I-C, uh, I mean uh, some, a, a woman who's, in this case, a woman who's prophetic, someone who seems to have insight into uh, the next world, someone who has magical powers. Um, and uh, Medea definitely has that. She is a, she is a witch. She is very powerful. Um, in fact, her powers helped Jason during his, uh, his adventures. She was able to help him get the Golden Fleece. She was able to wreak terrible havoc on his enemies. And you might say, well, if Jason had seen that, perhaps he would have thought twice about annoying her, knowing what this woman is like when roused. And, of course, this is... Uh, uh, this is shown, uh, again, worth mentioning as a type of secondary source, in uh, Pasolini's film of Medea, where Medea is quite clearly shown as a sort of high priestess of a barbaric cult that involves uh, human sacrifice. That's the sort of culture which Medea may have come from, that sort of uh, barbaric, strange, magical culture. And she intrudes in that way she, uh, into the, uh, the logical, rational, male world of Hellenism, which is represented by Jason and Corinth and so on. And because the rational male world does not take into account the power of the irrational, it then becomes undone and destroyed by that. And we also see that in uh, Euripides' play The Bacchae, uh, where again another male tries to look into um, into particular kind of feminine violent secrets that uh, that he's not meant to and ends up paying a terrible price for that. So we can say that Euripides is very interested in the irrational, the power of it, and particularly the feminine irrational as well. Another point where two of the texts intersect might be on the question of character and heroism. I've mentioned it before, but 
Oconquo in Things Fall Apart and Medea in Medea share a number of characteristics and perhaps most striking of that is they can't bear to be laughed at. They both consider themselves to be sort of powerful individuals who need to be taken seriously. Uh, and both of them are in some sense, they find themselves in a changing environment in which, uh, in which they're no longer able to, 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 to exercise their powers. They are heroes in a post-heroic world. Okay? And everything around them no longer supports them uh, as they used to be. Um, in Medea's case, uh, Jason seems to have turned into this sort of social climber who's worried about how am I going to sort of get by. And go, once he was an adventurer, he was fighting dragons, he was stealing golden fleeces. Now he seems to be concerned about yes, uh, his social standing. And uh, Medea sort of almost finds herself out of place. Uh, and again, potentially ridiculous because of that. Things fall apart, Conquo, that, that's for another lecture. Okay, so both of these characters are, are in some ways unsuited or unfit for the environment they find themselves in and perhaps, and perhaps need to cause destruction either of themselves or something close to them or others to, uh, to recover that sense of their own heroism. And lastly, I think, as, I'm, uh, as we mentioned before, Greek audiences would have known the stories before they went to, uh, to the theatre. Um, and in Medea's case, though, the story was rather different. The accepted story was, or one, one of the versions, there were always a few versions of myths, where um, uh, was that it was uh, after Medea killed Glauci and Creon, it was the people of Corinth killed the children. Now, uh, Robert Graves, the great poet and uh, uh, writer of um, Greek myths, uh, has has evidence, or shows evidence, that Euripides may have been bribed by the Corinthians to rewrite the myth to make Medea the killer of her children, not the Corinthians. Because whatever got performed at the Festival of Dionysus became the standard version of the myth. Okay, so if you could get your play put on in in, uh, in the Festival of Dionysus, you could, you, you could well, change the change canon, as I believe the modern term is. Um, and in some ways, Euripides succeeded in that. The story that we have of Medea now is basically Euripides' Medea, not the Medea that existed before. Uh, may also have accounted for the fact that that's why it came last, um, the accusations of bribery. Um, yes, and that, uh, and also the, even the kind of Perhaps the strangeness of it, the, the forcedness of it, the having to account for Medea's as a character, why would she murder her own children? I mean, we can sort of understand why she might murder Glavki, I mean, she might murder Jason, but her own children? Perhaps that's, that, that's why the play feels strange, it's because it's forced. But oddly, that, as I said earlier, that may, have also, may also be the reason for its longevity as a work of art.